Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Ecclesiastes 3, 11. Well, it's pretty hard to top that. So uh, thank you, girls. Uh, wow, what a great way to begin uh, Pentecost. So happy Pentecost. I thought... You know, in Easter we say he is risen, he is risen indeed. We need something for Pentecost. I don't know what it is, but somebody, if you can think of something, that would be great to share. Uh, what a great day it is to be the church, to come together in the hope and the joy and the power and the beauty of who God is and what he's doing through the life of his church. I want to welcome you. I'm Pastor Brady Johnston. Uh, it's Pastor April Failer. She's much more Pentecosty in her dress than I am today. So I told her, I said, every time I wear my red shirt, everybody thinks it looks like the Aggies color, and I just can't, I can't no, do it. So. No, please don't. That was not very unifying. Let's go back to the scripture to orient us on Pentecost. Sorry about that. All right. <laughs> Yeah, we look to Acts 2, and, and Pentecost today, is, we, it symbolizes the birth of the church. When this movement of God that came from Jesus was, was down to just a couple hundred people who waited expectantly for, for God to move through the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2 tells us that when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. So we gather here today expectant as they were expectant. For God to move in amazing ways through us, his church. And so with that, let's stand and yes. sing. All right. Maybe yes. Sing. We're going to, uh, congregation, if you could please stand. You're going to join us this morning in singing with us, Open My Eyes That I May See. And then our, we'll have our children's choir come up and sing a couple of more songs after you guys get to sing. So join me this morning. <laughs> Now I wait for thee, ready my God, thy will. 
get back up on stage. For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16 
Y'all come on down for, for godly play. All right. And y'all did an amazing job. I'm going to go and say on behalf of the, the whole church, thank you so much for helping lead us in worship today. Um, you made our day, and we are so grateful that we heard uh, your songs and your encouragement. And so we just thank you so much for being here. And we're going to have a prayer as you get ready for godly play. Can you put your hands together? All right. Father, we love you so much. Indeed, you are worthy of our praise, and we have 10,000 reasons and more to sing of your goodness and your faithfulness. We pray that you, through your Holy Spirit, will be with our girls and our kids as they go to godly play. May you meet them, and may you speak, and may you show your goodness to them. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Our ducklings are getting bigger. <laughs> They're growing up. If you would please rise for the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered from Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and of the life everlasting. Amen.
may be seated. I thought Pentecost Sunday would be a great time to, to share with you as a church some exciting things that are happening within the life of the church. If you were at our members meeting in December of 23, uh, it was some months ago at this point, but we, we shared some news that uh, we decided to have a consultant, to hire a consultant as a church, just to help us kind of navigate this unique season that we find ourselves in um, as a church. And so some of that work began earlier this year, uh, doing some of the, the digging and the work uh, to get there. In April, we had a team of, of church leaders and staff who met with a consultant with the express purpose of coming out with a three-year vision uh, for our church as well as next steps. And so a lot of the time in that room was trying to figure out what's a vision that we think the church can kind of rally behind of what the Lord is calling us to be and become in, in the next few years. And so we, we had a lot of conversation, as you might imagine, and, and, but we kept circling back to this, this one vision of the church in Scripture and it, you might have guessed, but it comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. If you've ever read those passages, oh my gosh, you will find a, a picture of the most compelling kind of community. Acts chapter 2 describes a church as a community where Christ was at the center of their life. Of a church who loved the word of God and didn't just seek to know it, but they wanted to embody it with their life. It was a church who prayed bold prayers, a church who was led by the Spirit, a church who loved one another so much that they called each other brothers and sisters. In fact, they loved each other so much, it says that they loved each other more than they loved their stuff, and so they let go of land and possessions to make sure that there was nobody within the community that had any kind of need. And they had a heart for a broken world and wanted to reach this world for Christ. And as a result of this, God did amazing things in their midst. All the conversation we had, we kept coming back to that. And we saw some of those elements in our life together. But we also said, man, we, we want to grow toward that. What a vision of a community. And we said, I think everybody in our church wants to become more and, and more of that. And we said, you know, our community, the world needs a church like that. And so we find ourselves, having done that work in April, we're in what we call the strategic phase, where we'll gather more leadership from the church to come together, and they'll come together for the purpose of clarifying our mission and vision. Because if we're going to move toward that goal, everyone in the church needs to know it, and we need to have a common language around it, because language builds community. And so they'll come together for that work. We'll also have a team that will look at our facilities that we currently have and make sure that they are prepared for ministry for the next three years in which we anticipate growth because we've been growing and we expect to continue to grow. And the desire for growth um, is, is that we want to reach people, and that was a lot that came out of this. We want to, as a church, recommit ourselves to reaching people who do not yet know the Lord. We know God may call many people here, and we're grateful and excited for anyone who the Lord might bring into his church. But we are really excited about picking up and taking seriously the mission of Jesus to reach those who do not yet know him. I want you to take a minute, and I want you to look around this room at the empty seats. You can look behind you, too. It's, it's okay. <laughs> but look at the empty seats. You know, we live in a growing community where thousands of people will wake up today not knowing the Lord. People who feel very far in distance from, from God. We know there are people who will wake up today and they feel isolated, as if there's no one in the world who understands them or cares about them. People whose relationships and marriages are hanging on by a thread. You know, we, look at, we know there are people who are here in, in our community, our neighbors and our friends, who wake up hopeless about their future. And yet we as a church are bearers of the good news of Jesus. And our hope and prayer is in the next three years, one and some of those people who don't know the Lord will find a place in one of these seats. 
and will find the greater gift of knowing Jesus as your Savior, knowing his love for them and their life, having a future filled with hope and full restoration and wholeness in their life. That's our desire. You know, we share this vision on Pentecost for a reason. Because we read the story earlier about a movement of God that took place in the life of the church. A movement inspired by God that transformed hearts and lives as the church stood up and proclaimed boldly the good news of Jesus for the world. And lives were changed. And the kingdom grew. And that's our hope and desire as a church. And so we'll be sharing more with you as as things develop Um, But I wanted to share that with you and hope you're excited. And as our ushers come down, we're going to pray specifically for for God's help as we seek to do his work. Uh, So would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, on this day of Pentecost, we are excited for the work that you started in the church, a work that began with Jesus but was empowered by you. When you flooded the life of the church and you called everyone unto Christ, even those who did not yet know him. And we pray that you would be with us as we seek to live into the mission and vision that Jesus, the head of the church, has given us his church. We know that we cannot do it without you, which excites us because we know that you are eager to do and continue a great work within us. And you're eager to do even more than you've already done. And so we open ourselves up in humility. Jesus, this church is not ours. It's yours. And we pray that you begin a movement, a stirring in the hearts of people in our community and beyond that we are ready to minister to and to share the good news of Jesus Christ that they might find the life that is truly life in you. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Help us, Lord. 
Help us to see beyond our current situation and know that you have full control over all that happens with us. Help us, Lord, learn how important it is to be able to see you and hear you and pray with you day after day after day. That we can learn to be more like David and that his constant conversation with you led you into a place, led him into a place where he became a strong, powerful follower that can lead Israel by covenant, by prayer, and by your strength. May we all be able to to submit ourselves to you in ways that we can walk with you better. That indeed it is in your time that things happen and not in our own. And we know that all strength that can be gathered came, comes from you. And Lord, we need your strength. Your strength is not just for those who are weary. It's not just for those who are weakened or broken. Strength is also something that we crave, Lord, because we know that indeed we are powerless. We need your strength so that we can stand tall and enjoy and appreciate all that has been created. We can be grateful for all that we have. And be in a place where we want no more. God, it is only with you that as we walk down the path of discipleship, that you are the one that is there to carry us when we can't walk one step more. Forgive us, Lord, for not seeing you. For forgetting your presence in our lives. Because we need you. Teach us to be more like you. To smile more like you. To love more like you. And hope more like you. Give us the ability to just to open our hearts up wide so that we can receive your grace. And the world looks very different than it did before. Continue to transform us, Lord, because we need you. And it's only through you that things can change. And that we can be transformed. So yes, Lord, we need your strength. Change us, Lord, from our heart out. So that we could come to know you in new ways and walk with you one step at a time. Forgive us for our lack of patience and our frustration when things happen on your time and not our own. And May we spend our lives learning more about you and about the mystery that, that defines you. Let us come together as a church and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible with you, I invite you to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 2. Uh, we have now carried over from 1 Samuel to 2 Samuel, and we'll be working through this as we're looking at the life of King David. But before we get into 2 Samuel chapter 2, I wanted to think about another scripture that well, actually David himself wrote, 
um, and one that might be just about the most popular scripture in all of the Bible, um, and it's Psalm 23. Uh, Many of you are familiar with this psalm. It's the most famous of all that David wrote, and it's a powerful psalm because of its imagery. I memorized Psalm 23. I believe it was when I was in third grade Sunday school with Miss Lucy because she told me I had to, and she was one of those people that was so close to God, you wanted her praying for you, not against you. So... I learned it, and not only did I learn it, but I learned it in the King James Version because that was the only right version according to Miss Lucy. Um, so uh, we memorize it. And so we looked at, you know, the, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. And he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You can stop right there. All right. We look at... The first part of Psalm 23 is so beautiful. And when you look at this, what David's describing as a shepherd himself was what his typical days look like. As a young shepherd, he would lead his flock up paths into the mountains and toward the mountaintops of the Judean hillsides. He would lead them there because it's there that the grass was green and untouched and the waters were still and untainted. It was the mountains, the mountaintops, where life was good and where resources abounded, where everything just fit and flowed for the sheep. And so he would take his his sheep up there for for respite and resources. And in the same way the sheep love the mountains, we love the mountaintops, don't we? Like when it comes to life, don't we love a good mountaintop season? Where life is easy and everything is good, we lack nothing. Nothing. But we've probably all lived enough life to know that not all of life is lived on the mountaintops, is it? No, some of life is lived in the valleys below. Psalm 23 takes an eerie turn in verse 4, doesn't it? You go from the mountaintop to the valley. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. As much as we love the mountaintops, man, we dislike living in the valley. And yet, no matter how much we resist it, we find ourselves in the valley from time to time. Part of the beauty of the first part of Psalm 23 is that it really, David records kind of the roller coaster nature of life. From mountaintop to valley, the ups and the downs, the twists and the turns that we all know life to be. And as we get into 2 Samuel, we find King David, who's been in the valley, we find him on a mountaintop moment. David has been, since our scripture we looked at last week in 1 Samuel 24, though he spared King Saul's life, David remained in the wilderness. Sorry, just vandalizing church property over here, so (laughs) forgive me. Um, But David looks, and he's, he's still on the run from Saul. And he hides from Saul in the wilderness, and it isn't until chapter 31 of 1 Samuel that King Saul is killed in battle. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 1, David discovers that Saul and Jonathan had been killed, and so David grieves for them. And we see a turn in chapter 2. David moves from grieving to inquiring of the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? He asked. And the Lord said, Go up. David asked, Where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So David went up there with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David also took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron in its towns. Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed David as king over the tribe of Judah. So David experiences, for the first time in a long time, a mountaintop moment where he's made king over a tribe of Judah. 
If you remember, the promise of God for David to become king took place in 1 Samuel chapter 16, where David was promised to be king over a unified nation that was currently in its state made up of 12 separate tribes. And so here David is for the first time recognized as king over one of those tribes, Judah. So this right here in chapter 2 is not the fulfillment of God's promise, but it is a step in the right direction. (laughs) For seven years, David has been on the run from Saul, looking over his shoulder at every turn. And for the first time in seven years, David gets a taste of God's promises. But if you read on from verse 4 in chapter 2, you'll find that it's not all good news for David. While there may have been a tribe that wanted David to be king, there were others who wanted um, Ishbosheth, uh, Saul's remaining son, to be king. These names, you know, like you need a seminary class just to pronounce them, all right? But there were some who wanted Ishbosheth to be king. And so a war broke out between the house of David and the house of Saul. And this war would rage on for seven more years. Seven more years. And if you like drama, then I encourage you to pick up the waypoints and read through chapters 2 through 4 of 2 Samuel. There's more drama in these chapters than anything you'll find on TV. Trust me. I'll sum it up for you in this. There are betrayals, betrothals, and lots of bloodshed. That's, that's what happens in these chapters. And, and finally, after chapter 4, when Ishbosheth is killed, uh, we find in chapter 5 the mountaintop moment that David has been waiting for for 14 years at this point. Turn with me to chapter 5 if you have your Bible open. We'll have the words on the screen. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on its military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, The king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. David finally gets his mountaintop. After 14 long years, the promise that God gave him all the way back in 1 Samuel chapter 16, when he was merely 16 years old, has finally been fulfilled. And it doesn't get any better for David than this moment. And there's something that this part of the story teaches us and a lesson, I I think, for us, and it's this. God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. And that may sound kind of obvious to us. And you might say, well, of course God keeps his promises. But let's just remember, that can be an easy thing for us to forget when you're in the wilderness. When you find yourself in a valley in life where there's nothing but adversity and hardship all around you, boy, it is easy to forget that God is a God who fulfills his promises. I mean, David spent 14 years of his life scraping by in the wilderness, 14 years on the run, hiding and living in caves. No life for a king in waiting. And there were moments in David's life we've already looked at where he began to forget that God is a God who keeps his promises. One of those is in chapter 23 of 1 Samuel when when 
Jonathan goes to David. If you remember, David, he's, he's holding on, trying to hold on to the promise of God, but his, his faith is failing him. And Jonathan goes to help him find strength in God. And do you remember what Jonathan said to him? Jonathan said, David, you will be king someday. Jonathan reminds him of the promise because David, he was forgetting it. He was losing hope. 14 years of waiting and hardship is enough to make some people lose some confidence in the Lord. But Jonathan says, no, David, God is a God who keeps his promises. And I want to speak that over every one of you who are walking through your own valley right now. Every one of you who who the imagery of the hardships of the wilderness resonates with you because of circumstances in your life. God is a God who keeps his promises. And we find hope and encouragement in the story of David, who through 14 years, long years of waiting, trusted ultimately in God through the ups and the downs and mountains and the valleys. He trusted God. And when it came time for God's promise to be fulfilled, he was ready to receive it because he trusted in the Lord. God is a God who keeps his promises. We read through these chapters, and I would encourage you to follow the waypoints, powerful stories here in the life of David. But we begin to see more and more reasons in these chapters of why David was called a man after God's own heart. Just a glimpse of some of the the points of character to be lifted up about David. We see that that David was merciful in spite of the havoc that Saul brought down on David's life time and time again. When Saul died, David grieved. And it's clear that David loved Saul in spite of Saul. He had respect for Saul's position even when Saul wasn't respectable. We see of David, one who loved the will of God and was always inquiring of God, as he did in chapter 2, seeking God's will, something we never saw in King Saul. And so we get these beautiful glimpses of David and why he is this, this king who pursued and loved the heart of God and reflected the heart of God. You know, as I get to this point in the story and reading through David's life, Uh, The question that came up for me was, man, how do you get there? Like, how do you get to be in in, in that place where your faith in God is so strong, where you're so quick to trust God? And I think to answer that question, we, we look not forward in the Scripture. We actually look backwards. And we don't go all the way back to chapter 16 in the promise or even chapter 17 in the big battle with Goliath. If you ask, where does David's faith come from? Where do we see this incredible character and integrity here in these passages? I I think we look back to the wilderness. And we go back to when David spent 14 years in the valley. You see, if you trace the theme of the desert and the wilderness all the way through Scripture, you'll find that the desert is often a symbol of a place of testing and trial. It's a place where hardships abound because of the lack of resources and the dangers that lurked around you. And because of this constant pressure that's always around you, it was this place that brought up and kind of brought out, it revealed what was really inside you, what faith you really had. That came out in the wilderness. We see that in Jesus' story in the beginning of the Gospels. And so the desert, the wilderness, is a a treacherous place to be. It's in that place, it serves as a kind of crucible where character is forged. It's a place of tribulation where, where you are encouraged to trust in the Lord. And and we see when we look in the Psalms, we see how David navigated. The wilderness. And there's a lesson in here for us of how we can navigate our own wilderness and come out with a stronger faith, not having lost faith, but with a more resilient faith. 
You know, David wrote many of the Psalms, one we've already looked at. He wrote many of the Psalms, and actually some of them were written while he was in the wilderness. The most famous of them is Psalm 63, written in the chapters leading up to 2 Samuel. In these first eight verses, David tells us what it means to have faith in our own wilderness. If you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. Verse 1, listen to what David says to us. He says, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water. Did you hear what David wanted while he was in the wilderness? You're in a place where the resources are scarce, where food is hard to come by and water even more difficult to find, where every day was defined by trying to get your most basic needs met. And David says, the thing I want more than something to drink or something to eat is you, Lord. You're what I want. I'm reading through that this week. I found that so compelling and convicting because I think for many of us, when we find ourselves in the wilderness, when we are really honest about what's the one thing we want, it's not always the Lord. Sometimes it is the water. Sometimes it is the food. And many times we find ourselves praying, not God, I want you. It's just God, fix these circumstances and fix the mess. And that's what we really desire is God, make my life easier. We would want the comfort. But David wanted God. And there's a lesson in here for us. If, if we are, when we are in the wilderness, we fix our eyes on ease and comfort, we will be disappointed. If that's all you want while walking through the valley is God, fix the mess of these circumstances. Make my life easy and comfortable. You will be disappointed. But if like David, in the wilderness you fix your eyes upon the Lord, it's then that you'll be satisfied. You see, what we see in David is one who looked to the Lord, who chose to fix his eyes upon not even his most basic needs, but upon the Lord. And because of that, he was strengthened and sustained and ultimately satisfied even in a drought-weary land. God sustains David because he fixes his eyes upon the Lord. Verses 2 through 7, David says this, I have seen you, God, in your sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing my With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you were my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. David worships in the wilderness. He worships in the wilderness. One of the beautiful things about David is he chooses to fix his eyes upon the Lord. It's one thing to do that for a moment. It's another thing to sustain your gaze and your your eyes upon the Lord. That takes a practice. And for David, that practice was worship. It was looking to God constantly. 
and finding strength from God constantly in his life because that's what worship does. Worship is, is not just singing a song, though that is a part of it. It is setting your heart. It is orienting your entire life to the Lord, and that's what David does. He fixes his eyes, and every time his vision begins to stray, he turns his eyes again to God in worship. That's why worship plays such a vital role in the life of the believer. It sustains our gaze upon the Lord. It keeps our eyes fixed. And this is never more important for us than when the darkness comes. And if you've been in the valley or found yourself in the wilderness, you know that the darkness comes. The beautiful thing about this verses here in verses 6 and 7 is David says, I watch you and I look at you even when the night begins to fall. Even when the darkness begins to shroud around me, it begins to cover me in my life. I keep my eyes fixed on you. And David says, I will sing even in the darkness. In the darkest moments of the worst place, I will sing to you. Because he says, ultimately, I know that I'm under the shadow of your wings. And this is such a beautiful image. Because I think for many of us, when the darkness comes in the worst of places in our life, we look at that and we think, my goodness, this is a sign of God's absence. But David in the shadows, in the darkness, says, God, this is a sign of your presence. For it is not the darkness that consumes me. I am in the shadow of your wings. Worship alone can help you find the presence of God in the darkness. See, David worships and his eyes remain fixed upon the Lord in the midst of his trial. In verse 8, he tells us the last thing. He says this, I cling to you. I cling to you. Something beautiful about this word cling. There's a number of words in the Hebrew language about gripping and holding on to something. Uh, clinging is a word that's kind of a stubborn word. It, it's kind of like holding on when it's all you can do is hold on. And David says, man, when I'm in those places, when I'm in the wilderness, I cling to you. I'm desperate in my need for you. And so David grips and he holds on to God. And there's something beautiful about that for us. We know in our wilderness, in our own valleys, that, that we must choose to stubbornly cling to God even when we have questions that aren't answered, even when things don't make sense, when there's mystery that, that causes concern in our heart or questions, we hold stubbornly to God. But if you've been in that valley before, you know that our grip can only be sustained for so long. For years, when I was younger, I would I was a, loved to rock climb. It was one of my favorite things to do. And recently, um, I started climbing again with guys that are half my age. And surprise, I've made it a year without getting a severe injury. But um, oftentimes, we get done climbing. You know, at the session, we'll there's a, some bars around there, and we'll do we'll hang and see who can hang on the longest. Um, I'm the only guy over 200 pounds, so I lose every time. But <laughs> I climb with some guys that are so strong, it would make your head spin. One guy can do uh, one-arm pull-ups, pull about. Pull it's just, I've never seen anything like it before. But there's something I learn every time we do that. No matter how strong you are, at some point your grip fails. It just does. It just does. And chances are in your life, you've had your grip begin to fail you. And so what happens in those moments in the wilderness when you're trying to cling, but man, you feel your grip slipping. Well, here's what David says, and it's good news for us. The second half of verse 8, David says, it is your right hand that upholds me. 
When I cling to you and my grip begins to slip, it is your right hand that upholds me. The right hand is the strong hand in the Hebrew culture. And David says, even when my grip begins to fail me, your grip never fails me. You're the one that holds me when I begin to fail and fall and falter and slip away. You're the one who grips me and you do not let me go. And for David, that's the hope in the wilderness. Not that I can hold on to you, but that you're the one that holds on to me. I'll cling to you, but my grip will fail me. God, you never will. What a beautiful thing to know in the wilderness. David, he looks at all of these things and adopts these practices of fixing his eyes and worshiping the Lord so that his eyes remain fixed, his confidence that even though he holds to God and his grip may slip, God is the one who holds on to him. And what this does in David is this builds a resiliency in him. It builds a resiliency that can stand up to the pressures, the external pressures in the world around him that his environment of the wilderness would exert against him. I read a story about an expedition some years ago. It was a group of scientists that took a deep sea submersible deeper than any human beings had ever gone before. Found themselves about 10,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. And it was there they found something that they did not expect to find. Life. <laughs> they found fish swimming around in some of the deepest depths of the oceans human beings had ever been. And they were just astonished because they knew at those depths the pressures of what was experienced at 10,000 feet was 500 times what you would experience on the surface of the ocean. Just to put that into perspective, um, that would be over 5,500 pounds of force per square inch. Put it this way. Look at your thumb. Imagine if someone had parked a dump truck on it but over your entire body. like that That's the kind of force that, that is exerted. And they're just seeing fish swimming around. And they were just astonished, and they couldn't figure it out for the longest time. Like, how in the world do these fish live under such extreme pressures until they finally figured out why? They realized that the pressures in the fish were equal to the pressures outside the fish. We see in David one who's able to withstand the extreme pressures of his environment and his kingship because of the resiliency that God built within him. And that's what happens in Psalm 63 as David looks upon the Lord, as he worships, as he cries out and clings and has ultimate confidence in a God who holds him. It builds a resiliency to not only survive a wilderness but thrive in it. And for any of you who are walking through a valley, it's my prayer for you. For any of you who, who are going to navigate uh, uh, your own valley or wilderness, that's my prayer for you. And we're going to come and close this sermon by praying together. If you want to come down and pray at the altar, if this is a place where you feel like, man, maybe I need to fix my eyes on you, Lord, and this is a response to come here, um, we invite you to come now. But I'm going to ask all of you to join me in, in praying for this. You're welcome to come if you would like to. Father, how grateful we are that you are the one who holds us. We all know that feeling of our grip slipping. We all know the feeling of the valley where our needs, our most pressing needs, we fear will go unmet. You know how we grow weary and yet you are the one who is present with us. Even when the darkness threatens to consume us, we're under the shadow of your wing. For you are the one who's present with us. Even in the worst of the worst, God, you are there. And so for those walking through their own valley, would you help them to fix their eyes upon you? 
that they may see you, that their confidence and their hope might be restored. That they might begin to see through you hope beyond whatever their circumstance might be. And we pray that they would begin to adopt the, the, worst, the practice of worship, to continue looking to you, that their gaze might be fixed upon you, that it wouldn't look at the waves crashing around or the lack and the, of resources and the struggle, the pressures that abound outside. They look to you and they would have confidence because you're the God that no matter what holds on to us. We thank you for being one who loves us so much, who is present with us when our nightmares become reality. So be within us. And we're going to ask you not just to transform our circumstances, but like King David, would you transform us? Grow our faith that we might withstand any pressure that life might press upon us. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. I invite you to stand and let us sing together. for joining us today. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, we're so glad that you're here. We have a gift for you, so be sure to see us um, on, on the way out. Uh, we also have a birthday cake for the church. So JW is so kind to buy a big cake for the church since it's the birth, Pentecost is the birth of the church. So we'll go over there, and if you want to share some food before you go to Sunday school class, man, grab you a slice of cake. There's nothing better than cake for breakfast, all right? So uh, we'll celebrate and be excited just of uh, the great thing that God is doing. Man, how thankful we are for um, that Jesus uh, loved us so much, not only that he would die for us and rise to give us new life, but that he would call us together, to come together as a community, that he might move and work and, and be alive, that we are his body here, alive, present in this world. So may we be that church whose hope and vision is for Christ to continue to do amazing things through us to reach and bless uh, those in our community with the good news of Jesus. Amen. And as we leave today, I will pray that you, wherever you go this week, whatever you're doing, may you dwell and cling to the words of this song. Join me as we sing. Surely the 